Welcome to another Got Safety webinar training session. I am co-host Rick Roman along with Michael Crow. Michael. And uh, today we are going to be talking to you about the new California IIPP update. It's going to be a doozy, um, Rick. It's going to be a doozy of an update today, Rick. An update it is, an, a, it is a, a, a big update. We've had a tremendous amount of people register to be in this webinar. I want to stall for a couple of minutes here before we really get going and let people uh, get in the room. I still see it's filling up rapidly. Um, but let me go ahead and get my my screen on here. Rick, you're doing a great job, Rick. You're, you're not in the office today. We're social distancing, aren't we, Rick? Yes, we are. Yes, he is. He doesn't want me to talk about this, but Rick uh, contracted the coronavirus, weirdly enough. We had to send him home and, and disinfect the office and put that all in place. Rick, how are you doing with your coronavirus uh, virus going on? Well, I'm on, I'm on the mend. I said okay. yesterday and today were... Good the beginning of good days. It was a little rough uh, for the first 10 or 11 days, but it's getting better. So I'm hoping by the end of the week, I should I should be good to go. Well, Rick, me, yeah, we'll take a couple extra days just to make sure you are good to go. You know what I'm saying? We don't need to have that stuff coming through the office. My gosh, we don't need that stuff coming through. No, the no, no. So you see my screen, Michael? Rick, I see your beautiful screen. I All do right. See it. I do see your beautiful screen. Uh, yes, uh, here at Got Safety, we've decided to put this webinar together because in the beginning of July, we've had some things pop out. I mean, you do not get a lot of changes to the IIPP. This one that we're going to go through, and I'll give the range to Rick here in a second, but this is really a great one. Uh, we've been doing this since 1991 with Got Safety, and uh, the majority of the people on our webinar today are going to be clients, but there are a few, a few select people that we've invited that are not clients that just kind of take a look at what's going on, give them the pleasure of seeing this update and Rick's got some information that he's going to give you so that we can all be good good and prepared for what's going on but this really is a monumental thing it's interesting that OSHA is putting this out at this time isn't it Rick they're putting it out at really a COVID time when possibly everybody's just trying to keep the doors open it, it is a weird time don't you think Rick yeah the timing is uh is is strange people have already got a lot of other struggles going on with OSHA like you said with the COVID stuff and complying with that and now they throw this in uh, with this new wrinkle. But as I sent out the invitations, yeah. uh, Michael, I got a lot of questions, people asking me back what an IIPP even was and, sure. and who it pertained to. So why don't you, before we really get into okay. changes, okay. why don't you tell a little bit about what is an IIPP and who needs one? Well, the first thing, as you can see on the screen here, the first thing in IIPP is it stands for Injury Illness Prevention Program. It comes from an OSHA code called 3203 from the Title VIII Code in California. And this really, back in 1990, 89, 1991 area, OSHA 3203 code came out and really gave power to the system to be able to give OSHA the power to come out and say hello to us in our businesses. So what it is, is it's a code that says, this is how you should be having your safety program, and this is how you're gonna implement all the other programs. So it is like an umbrella that shields all the safety programs that you're gonna see today, and we're gonna, get, we're gonna show you a list of, and then how to implement it. It tells you if you have an accident, what you're gonna do, how you're gonna do training, how often. It goes through a lot of different components. Now today, we're not gonna spend the time to go over all aspects of the IIPP. Can I get an amen, Rick? Yes, sir. He's not very excited <laughs> about the amen, by the way. But the idea is we're not going to show you every aspect of the IIPP. What we're going to show you today is specifically the changes within the IIPP that are taking chase so we don't bore you with everything that you probably already know. And this really is going to be the meat and potatoes to it. All right. And and who, who exactly does an IIPP uh, pertain to? Who has to have one of these? Rick, that is an excellent question. The IIPP pertains to everybody with employees in the state of California. Now, there is a discussion when it comes to about if you have under 10 employees, do I still really need an IIPP? The answer is yes, you do need an IIPP. There are some training records and stuff with that that you don't have to comply with as much, but the reality is every business in the state of California that has employees must have an injury illness prevention program, or for short, the IIPP. That's what we need to In fact, the code itself starts off by saying those very words that every yeah, business yeah. shall have and implement a written IIPP. Yes, so, it is. So if you're if, if you're on, on this webinar today and you work for a company, th this meeting is for you. 
And it's funny, right. it's like, well, an accounting office, do they need an IIPP? They do need an IIPP, a gas yeah. station, a factory, a construction, whichever really you're looking for. This, everybody needs the injury illness prevention plan. Yep. All right. Well, let's get into looking at the changes here. Bippity so bobby. what we're talking about here really is it's about the employee's right to access. And, mm -hmm. and that's what the change is. Section is, eight. And, and if you look here, with they have their definitions. And the first one, the term access, means the right and opportunity to examine and receive a copy. So what makes this different, Michael? Haven't employees always had the right to get access to the company's IIPP? They've, they've had the right to get access to the IIPP, but they have not had access, had opportunity to receive a copy of it. That is a change that could be perplexing for some, but the logic is you were always supposed to make it so that they had access. They would see it on paper form, maybe they had it on electronic. There's a number of ways you could have done it, but in this response, they're suggesting that they should be able to get a copy of it, which doesn't sound like that big of a problem at first, but as we go through the code with some of our listeners here today, Rick, this could be something that uh, may be a little burdensome. It could be. Um, it can get a little costly to, to mm -hmm. print all these copies. So um, in addition to the employee having access, the second term they talk about is a designated representative. Mm -hmm. So this means that any individual or organization to whom the employee gives written authorization to exercise a right of access. Collective bargaining agents shall be treated automatically as a designated representative. So we're talking about, Michael, here, if, if somebody has an attorney, a spouse, or yes. they, they can provide written authorization to somebody who can go in on their behalf and still request this written copy. And this is a new thing, Rick. This is a new thing. So the employee usually would see this at the facility and be able to see the program. But now, let's say the employee is passed or he's injured or something's happened. The wife needs to ask. The, the union needs to ask. There's a lot of things that could take place. And now you've got a lot more fingers in the cookie jar, if you will, trying to poke around and see where you're at. And this really makes it important for your injury illness prevention plan or as we like to say in the safety world, the IIPP, to be really streamlined. It must be up to code, up to date, and get that done. And a lot of people just don't look at their IIPP every year. Now, obviously, luckily, if you're a client of the God Safety System, we update your IIPP all the time. Keeping this update is what we do, and there is no charge for the updates, which we're telling you today. So the mass majority, like we said, that are listening on here today, your clients, your IIPP has already been up to date, or it, it's up being smacked right now and putting into the system. I think we've gotten them all done by now, but they kind of hit us with this a little bit of a surprise. And uh, we had to create the updates and then shove it into everybody's systems to make sure it complied to all the customizations that everybody has. It's been quite the trick, Rick, but that's kind of what we do. And a lot of these guys out there, they just aren't doing it. Yeah, so so that's that's really gr great news, you know. If you're a client of ours who we've already provided the the documentation for in the past, you can rest assured that yeah. that we've taken care of this for you. And as Michael said, uh, I think they're they're very close to having them completed. You can go into your God Safety Client Center and and see if it, if these updates are in there. If not, the, they'll we should have them done for sure, all of them by the end of the month. Um, but anyway, uh, so written authorization, as it mentioned that somebody with written authorization, uh, it says that they have to have the name and signature of the employee. It has to have the date of the request, the name of the designated representative, and the date upon which the authorization will expire if less than one year. So, so basically, if you don't, if if somebody doesn't put a date on this, that that request is then good for a full year. Otherwise, if they want it to be done earlier than that, they would post it on there. And if somebody were to come to your office uh, as a representative and had this authorization, then you would be provide you would be required to provide them the the written uh, copies of this. Yep. What we're doing is we're creating a form, Rick, we're going to put into the resources tab on their system and that uh, will have all this information on it lined down so that the employer will have a form that if somebody's looking for this, they'll be able to quickly send that form off. I think that's an important thing for us to have, and that'll make it real easy, Rick. 
Yes. Oh, by the way, I, I failed to mention at the beginning, if you have any questions, type them into the chat oh, yes. uh, and we will take we will answer all the questions once we get through the material here. So if you if you're as we go through anything, if there's anything unanswered and you have questions, please go ahead and, and put your questions into the chat. Yep, so yep. As, as we go through here. So now now they talk about the employer providing the access and they have to do so by doing one of the following. They have to provide access in a reasonable time, place and manner, but in no event later than five business days after the request. So once 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 you get the request, the they shall provide them the printed copy unless the employee or designated representative agrees to receive an electronic copy. So unless they specifically say they don't need it to be printed, you got to give it to them printed, Michael. And Rick, this is a funny one, and I and I'm interested to see how this implementation takes place. The reality of it is, the employee says, "Now I'd rather have a copy of it, paper copy." Oh my gosh! I mean, you're printing a book that could be anywhere from two to four hundred pages, depending on how many programs you have. This is substantial. And when you print the manual, as we're going to show you in a few minutes, you, are you going to section it out into individual programs? Are you just going to hit print, give them a wad of paper, no binder? I mean, there. There is a lot with this that is questionable on how we deliver this. Is it just a stack of 400 back-to-back -back pages, or are you going to binder it and section off into tabs, basically duplicate it, give it to them? The code, as you can see, doesn't specifically say that it has to be pretty, but I'm not looking to make this hard for people. But when I'm given 400 pieces of paper, I, I, I got to be honest with you, this can be overwhelming. In reality, most of our IIPPs aren't going to be that thick. They're probably 200 to 300, but still, Rick, 200, 300 pieces of paper, that's substantial. I mean, do you put it into an $8 binder? Do you, I don't know, put zip, lock, zip ties no. in at night? You know, and it's one of the things that you and I see all the time when we yeah. go out and, and and look at companies, IIPPs, when they have us go out and kind of do safety audits for them. Um, you know, people who've gotten them from other places that, uh, besides ourselves. And it's a common theme we see is where people write these to be basically an all in one mm -hmm. uh, inclusive book where yeah. all it touches on all the different aspects of their lockout, tag out, their has com and this and that, and as opposed to individual programs. So yeah. while you're doing this update and getting this stuff updated, it might be a great time to consider making your stuff to, to where it is tabbed out, like you said, into separate sections. Because yeah. I would suspect more than likely if somebody's asking to see the, the company's documentation, that it's probably going to be a situation maybe where somebody was injured and they want to yep. make sure that, that the company had the processes in place and, and what have you. And so they're probably only going to ask for certain parts of it. They're not necessarily going to ask you for the whole thing. Maybe they only want to see the lockout, tag out, and the IIPP. Whereas if you have that one and all binder, you're like you said, you're printing out three, 400 pages. But if you have it separated, you might only have to pin out 25, 30, 40 pages. And Rick, that really is the beauty of the way we build these things for our clients. They are sectioned off in individual programs and that you can go in electronically, send those off individually in the PDF files that they are. But you're right, Rick, it may be a question that you want to say, do you want the whole injury illness prevention plan, which is like the massive book, or do you just want the IIPP, the, the first section that describes how we're going to implement all the rest of the programs, and then a couple of the programs that are specific to your interest? That, that may be a good way to go out of Rick. I agree with you. Yeah, I mean, at least it it, it gives you a, a you know some relief possibly. Yep. yep, um, yep. And of course, if they say I want it all, well, then you got to print it all. But if you know, there's a good chance you might not have to. Anyway, then uh, also it says here one printed copy of the program shall be provided free yeah. of charge if the employer designated representative requests additional copies within one year of the previous request provided that the program hasn't been updated with new information, then you can charge a non-discriminatory reproduction cost. 
Now, and now, here's the good news. The good news to it is Cal OSHA doesn't typically send out a changes four or five times through the year on every program that's out there. Let's make that clear. So when Rick is talking about this and he's saying that as long as there's no changes that have been taking place, the reality of it is if, if they say, hey, I I've, I've want and in April, they request one printed copy. And then in July, they said, hey, I want another printed copy. It may be only one program has changed by then or or maybe just one little section has changed. So you, you wouldn't need to be able to provide that for free all over again. And that would be a good thing for us because the cost is, this cost could be substantial. I mean, Kinko's is getting expensive nowadays. Yeah, no kidding. Good so, night. I mean, you, you could spend hundreds of dollars printing all this stuff. Um, so the second option is providing unobstructed access through a company server or website, which allows an employee to review, print, email, and, and the current version of the program Unobstructed access means that the employee, as part of his or her regular work duties, predictably and routinely uses electronic means to communicate with management or coworkers. Ah, the beauty of this one. Now, this is my favorite one, Rick. This really is my favorite one because we knew that this kind of thing was going to be happening. We just didn't know when or what not. But now that it's here, we're, we're very pleased to say this is the God Safety System. This is the app that clients have access to. Your client, your your cut clients. Your employees already have access. If you're on our cot safety system with the app, they already have the access to this app so that they can see all of the individual programs that are there in PDF form. They already have access to all this that they routinely go to. Maybe they're using the app to sign off on their safety training. Maybe they're using the app to do uh, forklift inspections with our custom form builder. Maybe they've got uh, driving uh, car vehicle inspections they're doing, on-site accident in investigation reports on there. They're using this for a lot of things. Maybe they're referring to the repository for their uh, SDS sheets that are stored on here. The R app complies with this so beautifully. If you're a client of ours and you're not typically using it, you got to call into our customer service team, ask for Jennifer. She is my blessed sister. God bless her to death. My sister, Jennifer, in customer service, and she leads that team, and she will help you out to get you put into place so that you can have access and you can get training on the God safety, because this will help comply with this so that you don't have a, have a computer sitting in the middle of your warehouse where all the employees are just looking at collected dust and uh, doing things to it. Yeah, and, and we understand some of you guys in, in some of the warehouse uh, operations and what have you, you may not necessarily be having uh, your employees to have access. They may not have computers and things that they can get to there as part of, of, of their you know, work, uh, but in, in which case then you'd have to go with the option one here. But if, if you do have the ability to give them unobstructed access to where they can access it themselves, then then you're you're already meeting that criteria for them on that. And, and Rick, so, if I may just say again, the, this, the logic of this, I mean, we got to go to the app form. If you're not using an app in safety with your company, you got to change this because you're, you're, more people, I believe, in this world have toothbrushes than cell phones. I mean, cell phones than toothbrushes. I think more people have these smartphones than ever nowadays, and they can put this app and just keep all this documentation there. And then we don't have to worry about was it updated, all this other stuff. I just really think that if you don't have it, you should be talking to us about how you use this more in your workplace because this will solve this problem absolutely, completely. And for the majority of the people here that are already using our system, this isn't going to cost you anything. I mean, it doesn't cost exactly. anything like, to use. They can download the PDF and alleviate yeah. you having to print it for them. Ugh. All right, let's get on to the last bit of the changes here. Um, it does say that when you provide the program that you need not include any of the records or steps taken to implement and maintain the program. So yep, we're yep. talking about, Michael, here, any kind of inspection reports, yep. training records, things, 300 logs, things that are all part of maintaining your safety program. You don't have to provide them those things, but it's the actual core written programs yep. that we're talking about. And so real quick, Michael, so this does pertain to all the programs, right? It's not just the injury. Yes. 
It does. It does pertain to all the programs. Now, on the next slide, Rick, and I'm not saying to jump the gun, but we do have a list of the programs. Is that correct, yes. my good brother? We'll talk more about it. So, uh, you know, the, we'll go over this. And me and Rick are pretty familiar with all these things. We do this all day long, besides having the commonality of both being very bald. The reality of it is we, we just talk about this stuff all the time. We're very big in the safe. We love this stuff. And yeah, you got to give them access. So they may just want the injury illness prevention plan, which is a program in itself, remember, describing how we implement all the other programs. And then they may say, well, I want the heat illness or just the lockout tag out. So you may really only be giving them a couple of three different, I mean, how is that? Three different programs there that you'll be able to put on. And that way you may not have to give them all. Yep. So it also says that if employer has distinctly different separate operations with distinctly separate and different programs, the employer may limit access to the programs. Mm -hmm. Expound on that a little bit. That one sounds, uh, that's, it, this one I think is not going to pertain to too many people. Maybe not, maybe not, but I don't know. I don't know. So here's the logic of it. Let's say you have an injury illness prevention plan, you're a contractor, and you have an injury illness prevention program that is site specific, of course, on a job site in San Clemente. Well, let me be honest with you. The job site in San Fernando Valley, let's say they want to see your safety plan. Well, you'd only give them the safety plan of the San Fernando Valley because San Clemente is a different operation out there. So in that kind of a general, that could happen. But more specific to what we're thinking of, let's say you have a, uh, you, you, you've got it like a uh, goodwill plant, uh, well, not a goodwill plant, but like a, uh, boy, Rick, this is going to kill me. We're going to get some ugly comments. What are those stores that you go into to buy used clothes? My gosh. It is a goodwill store. Is that what they call it? But it's Goodwill's a brand. We don't want to say Goodwill. We want to say no. secondhand store. Thank you. Let's say you have a secondhand store. You would need an IIPP for the secondhand store location, the retail store. And then if you had a warehouse where they had sifting and gathering and cleaning or whatever they had, then you would need an IIPP for that. So in that kind of circumstance, you would have two. And the employee that didn't work at the warehouse would not be able to get access to the warehouse IIPP in that kind of a scenario. But I do agree with Rick. Most companies have the same operation. It's just different locations. Yep. All right. Now here's here's the real uh, tricky part. It mm -hmm. says the employer shall communicate the right and procedure <sighs> to access the programs to all employees. Well, let me tell you, this is going to be a difficult one because through this whole thing, I know we were all thinking the same thing. All right. Well, the change is going to take place. And then we may not tell anybody. Nope, that's actually in the code. They knew you were going to say that because you didn't want to have to give out these IIPPs for free. Me and Rick thought the same thing. We're like, well, my gosh, how many people are going to tell them about this? Nope, it's in the code. So what you have to do is you have to do training. You actually have to show that you've told your employees about these rights. It's not just a poster on the yes. wall. This is just not something that you put on the wall and hope they don't read like the labor law poster. This is something that you actually have to teach them. And thus, We've created a lesson, didn't you know, at no charge to our clients, of course, and we put this into the webinar today so that you can have access to it. And it talks about this training in the most uh, compliant, I want to make that clear, but in a compliant way we can do it without telling them, hey, guys, let's uh, run up all these printing charges just so that you can make paper airplanes with a book that you probably never read. I know that's probably sarcastic. It's not the best, right? <laughs> but yes, this this is not going to be the world's best kept secret. You are no. required to educate your employees so that they know of their right to access. That way, if they ever have a circumstance where they need it, they'll know that it's, it's within their right to ask. Yep, yep. Um, and then the last one, it says nothing in this section is intended to preclude employees and collective bargaining agents from collectively bargaining to obtain access information in addition to val to uh, that is available under this section. So let's, you know, Michael was just talking about, let's see here, the, the, uh, the training and yep. they, you should see an attachment here. Um, all of you have access through your GOT Safety Client Center that are clients. But for those of you that are with us today that are not clients, as a, a courtesy, we thought we would just add these attachments that you yes. can download and print. You'll notice here there's this this one here is for employees, it, and it talks about letting them know that, that they have the, the right to ask for these copies and that within five days they can receive them. And then we also have a management one. We don't want your management. You, to not be aware of this change and mm -hmm. possibly throw you under the bus by yes. telling an employee that they can't have something that they have the right to, to have. 
So we need to make sure that all of the management and your and your supervisors are trained to know this, that if employees ever ask, if they have to direct them to somebody above, then that, that so be it. But they need to know what they have to do to make sure that the employees can get the access that they have right to. And as you can see here, we have, like I said, there's your employee lesson, your management lesson, and then we also have them, of course, in Spanish so that we can communicate this to everybody. Well, we're trying to do it all. The style between the two lessons, you may say, well, why don't we just have one lesson that does it all? And it's because in the management lesson, we're a little bit bolder. We're just a little bit bolder with the right with the law so they know. And then in the employee lesson, we just kind of cover it all and just kind of the bullet points to make sure it's not like, hey, listen, you can train the company of a paper copy every year. I, we, we kind of put it into a way that's a little bit more softer. We're not trying to hide everything, of course. Let me make sure that's clear. But we're wanting to be business friendly here and uh, comply with the code, of course, and, and really be business friendly so we not to know the employee the, the, let the employees know their rights but at the same time not tell them how to choke us to death I hope that's not offensive exactly anymore. so we were talking a little bit before about the various programs mm -hmm. and, and here's a list of them Michael yeah. uh, and, and of course it's not all of them but it's not many of the popular programs that that somebody might have and like I mentioned we often see how people have them where they will take the eight, 10, 12 of these that might pertain to them and somehow incorporate it into one document. Mm -hmm. and, and let me just tell you that right now, you, you already have to, you have to make the written change to your IIPP at the very least to implement, to show these new changes. You, you have to make that, that change in the IIPP. You have to do the training with your employees. But since you already have to make this change, this is a great time to consider if mm -hmm. you have documentation that is written as an all-in-one program to update them to make them into sections. You now have two great reasons to do that. And I'll let mm -hmm. Michael go over, but the first one here is, Michael, because of OSHA, if you would. Yep. And so the last slide that Rick had on the board really talks about all the different programs and, and not everybody needs them all. We know that. But a lot of times people are creating programs just to create programs. They're just like, hey, listen, we're cutting zucchini. So we're going to need this cutting zucchini program. But so when our programs come out, we write programs that the Kalosha code actually says you must have a program for this. So we're, we're, we keep it very simple and direct on this. Now, what you're looking at here on the screen is a document request sheet from Cal OSHA. Cal OSHA, when they come out, they'll use this document request sheet. Sometimes when they hit you and they're coming out there and they're talking with you, they'll ask you questions such as this. They'll say, hey, do you, uh, do you have a copy of your injury illness prevention plan? And you'll say, oh my gosh, yeah, 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 let me get that for you. And they'll start rattling off requests that they have from work proofers, workers comp or whatever. Most people don't realize that in this circumstance, you can actually ask for or a checklist. You can ask for the checklist, and this is actually the checklist you would get. So you would say, hey, do you mind, Mr. OSHA person, because obviously we want to be very friendly to these people, because you know what? They are just trying to do their job in a lot of ways, and we've got to be respectful, right? So what you do is you say, hey, Mr. OSHA person, do you mind putting that into a formal request, and I would be glad to provide you with all those things. Most OSHA inspectors will say, sure, that's fine. They'll give you about three to five days to comply with this, and then you can have this. This will make it so you're not running around your job site or anything with your like a chicken with your head cut off. Now, the only exception to the rule that I just described is that when you're on a construction site, site-specific construction site, and they ask for these things, you must show them them there. You, you've got to be able to show that you have the IIPP and these programs at the job sites at all times. So that's the kind of thing that you're going to want to show them. And if they say, can I have a copy, then you would say, I would be glad to get you a copy. If you can put that into a formal request, I would get that for you. And in that response, then this sheet would come out. And what you can see here is the injury illness prevention plan is the first one that's golden right there. That is a standalone document. Just like in our list a few minutes ago that we're showing you, that IIPP is a standalone document. Usually this program, it's not that extensive. It only is about seven to 10 pages, really, to be honest with you. Because like I said, it's an overview of how you're gonna deal with all these other things. And then they have their most common here. The second one is the heat illness. You know, my gosh, we're getting hit by that every summer. The action investigation, the fire, the hazards, the, the uh, respiratory protection program. And then obviously they have some fill in the blanks at the bottom. So this is something that as you're looking at this piece of paper, you can say, 
all right, th this really is a great training operation for our management so that they can see what could be asked on a job site and they can start to get familiar with the terminologies of the program. So when ocean expert is out there, a safety person from OSHA says, can I see your IIPP? And they go, uh, what, what, what's an IIPP? You just look like you don't know what you're doing. So these terminologies and EAP and emergency action plan, they should know them well enough so that if somebody catches you off guard with these acronyms, which God bless the safety community, they love to create acronyms. Am I right, Rick? Yes, they do. Good night. I always have to say stop with the acronyms. But in that response, this sheet would tell you, this will tell you what you need to be doing and, and what you need to have uh, locked and loaded for you. And you'll notice because that they list all of these programs separate. I mean, you can see eight, mm -hmm. 10, 12 of them that are highlighted there. And so they generally don't come in and ask you for all of these. They they're, they're probably have a focus of, of their, their investigation. Maybe you had an employee that, that was injured or there was a complaint or whatever the nature of the call was. They're probably, you know, maybe if you had a guy that had heat stroke, they're going to want to see your, your heat illness. They're going to want to mm -hmm. see your uh, injury illness prevention program. They're going to want to see your emergency action plan but they're not gonna ask you for all of those others. And when you have that all in one written document, and so in order to give them what they want, you now have to give them everything. And the key is, is that when they open this investigation, they have up to six months to decide whether or not they're gonna cite you. And yep. now you have just given them all of your documentation that they didn't even request, and you've basically given them a license to go on a six month fishing expedition to see what else that they don't like about your programs. Michael, have you not seen dozens of times where clients have been cited for programs that weren't compliant that had nothing to do with the the, the purpose of the, the inspection to begin with? Well, not our clients, Rick, because their programs are up to date. But yes, most, more clients that we know that we pick up when they're in the pinch. Yes, we agree with you. They find themselves in this area. But even if your programs are totally up to compliant and you're saying, listen, I show mine when I get permits all the time. I'm confident I am golden. My point to you is this. You're still giving them ideas. Even if your program is locked and loaded and you show them this program, they go, hmm, you know, I didn't think about respirators. I didn't even know they had them. They have a respiratory program. I'm going to poke into that. It gives them the opportunity to poke into things that maybe they didn't really care about at the time, but maybe they got bored when they got back to the office. So that so so this is obviously your 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 first and probably primary reason of, of why it's a good idea to have them written as separate programs. OSHA, like yeah. Michael mentioned, mandates which ones need to have programs and tells you which ones you need based off of what you do. But the second reason would be the update of today. If you've got a client that that got you know, cut a finger off or something and he wants to see your lockout tag out program, but he's not asking for all of these other things. You could spend hundreds of dollars printing these hundreds of pages if yes. everything's in one binder. Whereas if they're only asking to see a couple of particular documents, you could print off just what they want. So yep. now you have two good reasons to make sure that your documentation is written in this format to where there's separate individual programs. Yep. So anyway, Michael, that that is the end of all right, so we got the end. Is there any the questions? Presentation here, John. Today, Rick? Do we have any any questions for us today? Maybe maybe somebody's asking why we're so good looking, two guys, right, Rick? <laughs> maybe somebody wants to know why you haven't grown a beard yet, Rick. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we've got a lot of questions. Um, oh, great. And so we might not be able to get to all of them, but uh, one of the general questions, you know, a lot of people asked, does it have to be electronic? Does it have to be in print? You know, maybe you can just clear that up. Yeah, real quick. Uh, no, it doesn't have to be electronic. It could be just in print and it can be that. But I would say this with the God Safety app that we have, I'm telling you pennies on the dollars, you'll save more money. Your one print job on one of these IIPP has got to be worth a few hundred bucks if you're Kinko's. So uh, our app really sells for about 79 bucks per 100 employees. And so to be very honest with you, most people will have this electronically and done it. But more of our clients will have it, John. Yeah. Um, next question, a lot of people are asking about the IIPP and employee handbooks, if they should integrate them, keep them separate. Separate, please. 
separate. And there are two different handbooks that you have. And the reason why is this, is that we don't need OSHA looking at your employee handbook with all the things that are taking place. If they want it, they'll ask for it. But like Rick said a few minutes ago, you want to, you want to separate everything, have individual program style to put together. So when they're in a book, they're tabbed out and separated, separate, separate, separate. Good, good. All right. Um, a few people were asking how they will know if the IIPP has been updated in their GOT safety system, if there's an actual stamp of revision or, you know, how that's, <laughs> that's I mean, a good question. Yeah. Well, Michael, I said, real quick, it, there's a section eight in, so if you look and you'll see section eight yes. and it talks about the employee's right to access and you'll see that right in, in the first, right, right yes. at the top. Uh, so, so when you go through that, if you see that that update has been in there and it talks about those things that we talked about today, you'll know that you're updated. And if not, uh, like I said, by the end of the month, you will be updated. So in the next week or so, we will be fully updated in all of them. We're just doing the tail end of the IIPP, so at the end of the month. And so over the next couple of months, the lessons that will be come out, if you're subscribing to our on-site service in California, remember from San Diego to the Sacramento, San Francisco Bay, we're going to be providing these trainings for you and putting them in place. Unless you want us to do another one, we're going to be recommending these lessons so that we can get the training on the bound. OSHA always has a grace period before they start hitting us with citations, and we're in that grace period right now. It's unreasonable to put out a code and then say, all right, we have to implement it this very second. So we're in that grace period, but uh, Rick is right. And once all the updates are done, emails will start to come out and telling everybody your books have been updated and whatnot. And so the, the, very, the, the, more, the most majority of the clients, you've already should have a re received an email already letting them know that it was updated. Okay, great. Uh, one client who may not be in uh, part of our California clients was asking, is this a, a change just for Cal OSHA or is this OSHA in general? This is a change for the Cal OSHA system. God bless California. They like to change things at the best times possible, don't they? <laughs> um, okay, let's move on here. Uh, some people were asking about if there had to be any specific COVID portions in the IIPP. I, I, I assumed that it was just, that would be part of your infectious disease program, which is, you know, separate from the IIPP. Is that not? There, there does not need to have any specific program that says COVID. There's no code for a COVID program or anything like that, infectious disease program, but then there's requirements if you need the infectious disease program. But the answer to it is you must be doing some sort of training. So we created back in April and May and have been updating those lessons, our, our pandemic, post-pandemic safety trainings that you'll find on our database. Those are all included in what you pay. Just keep doing those trainings if you have an issue. You can see Rick's working from home. He he got the COVID. We've, uh, we've kicked him out like a stepchild that's probably not that funny but no we sent him home to be able to recuperate and he is looking like uh he's probably aged a bit rick you do look like you've aged a little but looking <laughs> very good rick very good all overall so yes awesome um so a very important question here does a company domiciled in another state with california employees need an iipp Yes, the California employees do need an IEPP. So you have your one side of the business where you have an, a, an, a safety manual in that state, and then your California businesses need, and where those guys are working, they need access to their own injury illness prevention. Let's suggest those employees are not working at a site, but they're remote employees. Thus, the Got Safety app would come in place, and as they opened it up, they would see one for California employees, and then one for the location where your home business was based. And I can tell you, we see tons yeah, of companies common. that get cited uh, that aren't from California because they yep. were working in California. Yep. So True. in California, you got to play by the California rules. All right. Keep it going, John. John. All right. Uh, here's another one. Uh, if OSHA is asking for the IIPP, are they asking for just the core or standalone IIPP document? They are or asking for the standalone. In your, in your um, document request, right? That would, and that would be the standalone document. It's a misnomer that takes place. They are only asking for that eight to 10 page document, your injury illness prevention. Hence in that document request where they have the other programs labeled out individually. Very good. Okay. Um, someone asked, what's the form number for the OSHA document requests? Rick, form number. My gosh, these guys are getting good. I don't have the form number offhand, but that's a good one, Rick. Uh, I don't see it on here. I'm looking here. I don't know. 
But if this you, is not one if, they give out to people, this is one that we have because we get billions of them from our clients, and then we just blast on the internet. And there's nothing wrong with us doing it, but yeah, it's not a form in the sense that they have a number to it that they ask for. If Rick, if you find a number, would you send out some sort sure. of notification? Sure. Yeah, I don't see an, an actual number for it though. What okay, else you got, John? Uh, I got another one. What date does this have to be implemented by? I'm assuming they're meaning the IIPP change. Yeah. Uh, People have asked, you know, when do I have to notify my employees by? How long do we have? This went into effect by July 1st, 2020. That's the way Cal OSHA works. They don't say, hey, here's a law coming out. We're going to give you six months to be able to get ready for it, and then you'll be cited. No, they just come out and say, hey, July 1st, this law came into be. By the way, here's the update, and we have to scramble to get it. This is why people, when they look at us, go, wait a minute, it's already July. You don't have these updates stuff? It's because we just get them when we get them. We, there are so many rumors within Cal OSHA, the Cal OSHA reporter and different things that are saying, hey, this is being talked about. That may come into law. That may. We actually have to wait for it to hit because it may take years or that what we think is going to hit is vastly different than the law that when it pops out. It, it's, it's a problem. But we are in a grace period and it's not an official grace period. I want to make this clear. But usually what we see is a one to three month grace period where they're allowing people to get in before they start beating down the doors. And we've provided you with the lessons. There's really, there's no reason to delay yeah, in, there's no in, reason to delay in notifying. Anything. Okay, we've got one more. Um, should you list a backup contact representative? May you turn OSHA away if the contact person is not on site? Well, you can have a contact person, and if the person's on, not on site when OSHA comes, you can ask them if they could come back at a better time. But if your specific question is if you can turn them away, the answer is yes, you can. You can turn OSHA away and mandate they get a search warrant. Now, I am by no means saying that's a great idea. Listen, before you're it's trying to pet, pet, it is a terrible idea. If you're trying to pet a dog, I wouldn't kick it before you pet it. I mean, it just doesn't usually go well. I'm not saying OSHA's are dogs. They're great people. I know, I know very many of them. I have a lot of love and respect for them. But these people are looking to come in, and usually they're looking to come in and focus on one thing unless you got major problems and get out. And I would stick to that. I would stick to that and educate your people. But if there's nobody there to walk through them, I think a kind question saying, do you mind, this is not a great time, and my, my boss or manager, the contact, is this something you could come back another time and be gracious about it? These are good people, and I think they'll they'll honor the request. But if they don't, you have a choice to make. Okay, uh, I, I do want to address this. There, there have been several people that work for staffing companies that you can imagine, you know, have some questions about, yeah. uh, you know, their responsibility and the customers who use your workers and all that. So what about staffing companies? John, specifically staffing companies with regards to what? Um, the responsibility, I, I think they're referring to the IIPP. Um, so a staffing you know, what, company... What is, what is their responsibility for the IIPP to their temporary employees and all that? So a staffing company must have their own injury illness prevention plan. They cannot rely upon the company they're leasing the employees to. The company they're leasing to must have their own individual safety plan. So with regards to that, the staffing company has a responsibility to train their employees to notify them or to get a signature saying they've been notified of these rule changes and taking place. Thus, the God Safety app is a perfect solution for that, where you can send out telling your employees, hey, listen, take this app online, watch the video, uh, take the lesson and sign off of it. And then that way you collect the workers for all your mobile employees. It's very simple in that area. And that's what we built the app for. Perfect. Okay, last thing, um, just just to, you know, some of our clients that may be confused, where are they going to find the um, the their IIPP program and where are they going to find the safety lesson? Where are they going to find the IIPP program and the safety lesson? Okay, so if they're clients of ours, they're going to go onto their database and when they log on to gotsafety.com and they log into their account, they'll go under documentation, the injury illness prevention program will be right there. If you go to safety lessons and you type in IIPP into the safety lessons tab on your client center, and if you're using the app, both of these things will work. There's a safety lessons tab and a documentation tab. All those things are there. They'll be easy to access and be able to have it. And if you're still having problems, just call in and ask for our customer service team. They're here for you eight hours a day, most days of the year. And what's that number so that our audience can have that phone number to call us? Our, our phone number has not changed in 30 years, Rick, since we've been in business. It is 
3574. It is at the bottom of all the emails we send you from your schedulers to your contacts. Go to gotsafety.com and you'll be able to find the phone number there too. No big deal, guys. Perfect. Okay, I think that's all we have time for. Thanks, John. And John, are, are these lessons available in video format as well? They, they are, both in English and Spanish. They are available for your viewing. Mm -hmm. All right. So we, we provided the free PDFs. That way, if somebody is not a client, you can at least have the resources to train your folks. But if you are a client and have full access, got safety, then you, you even got it in video format. Hey, before we close out, let me just say this. I appreciate everybody coming out today. I hope this information was helpful. If you have questions, please call in. You can talk to your schedulers, our customer service team, and we would be glad to help you out everything that you need. If you are one of the very, very few select people that you got a, 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 an invitation to come out to this webinar, we welcome you. We would love to be able to help you. And uh, if you have any information that you want us to go over or double check to see if it's up to code for you, just give us a call. We would love to go over that with you. You can ask for uh, Rick me, Michael, or Steven, either one of those guys would love to help you. Yep, and also we have uh, several of you who are uh, partners of some of our insurance partners that we work with. So if you find yourself in a spot where you need help in uh, creating any of this documentation and making sure you have everything you need there, uh, contact your your insurance rep and and let them know that you attended this webinar and and you're interested in getting help. And again, we'd love to help you as well. Thank you guys for coming. Rick, you got anything else, Bun? That's it. That'll do it. We'll let everyone get back to work. All See right. Thanks time, for guys. coming, everybody. Thank you.